so it is my pleasure to be here uh, speaking with uh, three people who are thinking about how governments are going to transform the way that we know, think, and live in cities. Uh, so I have Ashley Han, who is the Chief Innovation Officer of Kansas City, Peter Marks, who is the Chief Technology Officer for the City of Los Angeles, and Catherine Oliver, who is Principal of Bloomberg Associates. And when we were backstage, um, Peter had described Catherine as uh, our patron saint for cities, uh, since uh, you know she had been at the ground floor of launching the chief digital, excuse me, the chief digital officer role in the city of New York, which was the first role of its kind in this country and I think the world. Um, and so I'd love to kick it off with just hearing from Catherine, you know, about that. Um, and, and what that means today, and then we can go through and hear about what's happening at the other sure, cities. Sure, yeah. So I guess it was about 2008, 2009, um, I was in the Bloomberg administration, and um, you know we really saw the tech sector taking off in New York. And after the banking crisis, it just really underscored that in New York, Mayor Bloomberg's vision of diversifying the city's economy, which really began at the beginning of the administration in 2002, right after 9-11, and how true it was, you know, fast forward to 08, 09 with the banking collapse in New York, to really look at other sectors in the city and to really diversify the city's economy. And so it was the beginning of the third term, and we decided to create a new agency, NYC Digital, which was part of economic development for the city. Um, but it was also very telling because we could see in in real time how the technology sector was taking off and how businesses were changing and becoming more reliant on digital initiatives, mobile initiatives, tech initiatives. And so I think the vision creating the chief digital officer was twofold. Um, initially, internally, how could government use technology to provide better services, uh, provide transparencies in government, and better communication strategies? And externally, from an economic development standpoint, it's where the new jobs were. And it also behooved us to look at how we could retrain and reposition legacy businesses in New York for the future. So that was the genesis of creating NYC Digital and then creating this position to really be an advocate for the industry, to be a cheerleader for the industry, and you know, to really learn from a business development standpoint what did these companies need and how could the city best serve them so that they could grow. Thanks. And Peter, your role is Chief Technology Officer, so slightly different title, uh, and you come at it from a slightly different background. Can you tell us a little bit about what your role means and what your mandate is in Los Angeles? Sure. So <clears throat> I think the city of Los Angeles is sort of famously having a moment right now. We have this uh, very emergent tech industry. It's only just slightly smaller than the very famous media and entertainment industry in, in, in Los Angeles. And then in addition, uh, the city government is going through this transformation, which is that we're really, if you will, uh, very much developing digital services. Uh, we've put together all of our websites, for example, through a global navigation bar. Uh, we launched an open data portal about a year ago where we're, we're essentially taking all the city-provided data and making it available to everybody. Uh, most famously, a couple weeks ago, we announced a deal that we had done with uh, an app provider called Waze, mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, how many and, and people those, here are familiar with Waze? Yeah. How many? Yeah. So <clears throat> in Los Angeles, you know, LA is known for good weather and creative people and good universities. Some folks also have noticed that there's some traffic there. <laughs> and um, in a way, uh, it, there's some, more, some large number of folks, we don't quite know how many uh, as a percentage, but about 1.3 million people are using Waze in the city of LA. And so using city data about construction and farmers markets and marathons and uh, you know, a very LA thing, giving them the information about the film shoots and so on, allows all those folks to be you know, routed around uh, congestion. And it's a really simple example, but we're watching government and we're watching private industry and we're watching a tech industry really evolve uh, sort of in real time, uh, uh, you know, to make a better city. And that's very much where LA wants to be. So. And actually, your background is uh, in architecture uh, and you joined as the chief innovation officer. So what does that mean for Kansas City and what's your mandate? 
So I started off as the city's first chief innovation officer. So originally, I was hired to focus on process improvement. And I think it, we acknowledged that our community was rapidly evolving, uh, expecting services delivered in different ways. And certainly, uh, we needed to catch up a little bit as kind of the nature of our community was evolving. So to the city hall needed to evolve. So I was hired to bring on that, uh, to focus on process improvement. But essentially, I think with the emerging uh, tech sector that we have in Kansas City, a lot of people have been attracted to us through uh, the advent of Google Fiber, and we have a pretty remarkable entrepreneurial community and support net, uh, network through groups like the Kauffman Foundation and others. We've kind of started to look at how do we better leverage public-private partnerships to provide better services, not only to the communities we serve, but also to attract more people to come in and do work in Kansas City. So creating environments where government serves as a platform for innovation, where entrepreneurs can come and test their ideas with us is another part of what we've tried to do to continue to evolve what it meant to uh, partner with the, the public sector. Mm -hmm. And as, as we hear each of you, you know, you're hearing a lot of innovation. In some ways, it sounds like many startups uh, within big, huge agencies. And so how is it working within city government? You know, or how are you making it work so that you can push through a lot of change really quickly? Any thoughts on that? Okay. Maybe. So it, it does feel very much like a startup environment, uh, in which is that you know, when Mayor Garcetti was elected, you know, he's, he's very um, has a strong affinity for technology and for digital and for innovation. And so, uh, as an example, the second executive directive that he did was around creating a cyber, a cyber intrusion command center for cybersecurity. And the, second, the third executive directive was around doing open data. And then after that, we essentially said, well, what else is happening that we really want to tackle, whether it be public safety or whether it be transportation and so on. And so, if you will, you, just like in a startup, you have to go find consensus, a good idea, you know, the community to go drive it, the funding for it, the resources. And then, you know, in a very sort of non-government uh, classic way, you know, government tends to build a bridge knowing exactly how the bridge is going to look at the end of the day. But as we all know, in digital, everything is agile, mm -hmm. right? You do something, you put out a minimum viable product, you iterate, you see how people react to it, you develop, you develop, you develop. And I think that to a certain degree with the emergence of technologies hitting all of us, it feels very much like a startup. So. And I would say that we were, we kind of started from the idea of innovation not needing a lot of new resources. So I actually started with no budget and no staff. Right. Uh, so I would say the lean <laughs> methodology like is applied. Yep. Yeah, and, uh, they literally dropped me off in an office as the first closed office environment I had ever worked in. And I literally did not know where I was going to go. because There were no people around. So I, yeah. I had to go out and find the people. And, and we built innovation teams by finding those folks that are change agents already, but may not have been given a platform through the bureaucracy to get those great ideas forward. And so we built these small teams that were able to quickly execute on ideas. And once you get those first few wins, you've built credibility. And all of a sudden, more people are supporting you. And now we are building capacity. And we are looking outside the organization to grow that. But absolutely, this idea of um, focusing the risk on my office to help kind of alleviate some of the pressure on others that have a, have a a real responsibility to the public, we were able to kind of open that up a little bit to allow for some of that innovation and, and testing and, and sometimes failure. Not everything's been 100% successful, but I think we've made some really great but progress. But I think, you know, for all, the three of us came from the private sector to yes. government, and I came from Bloomberg, which was, you know, very technologically mm -hmm. savvy, and then going to city government, I mean, literally in the agency, the first agency I was working in, the film commission, they were working on electric typewriters mm -hmm. and processing permits <laughs> by hand. So after coming from the world of Bloomberg to that, I mean, it was astonishing, mm -hmm. but a lot of city agencies were structured that way. But the other thing that was really interesting, and it still exists, is now in my new job as uh, at Bloomberg Associates, we're consulting with other cities, is that so many city agencies and government, it's siloed, mm -hmm. and the agencies are not talking to each mm -hmm. other. And for years, they've been working, so the fire department, you know, is not communicating with the police department or with the parks department. And so I think now with technology, 
that connects them mm -hmm. more effectively. Mm -hmm. And so I think that certainly helps. Um, and I think also going into the closed office space, you know, we try to create the open, you know, bullpen atmosphere mm -hmm. within government. And now you're starting to see more of that. And I think that, again, you know, having some of these private sector sensibilities and being applied are being helpful. Um, the other thing is creating public-private partnerships. When we started NYC Digital, you know, and we went to many agencies, and they were like, we don't have the staff to, you know, to hire social right. media managers. But lo and behold, they actually had people, mostly their communications folks, who were tweeting and, mm -hmm. and starting to use some of these social media supports. Um, but the other staff members didn't know how to use these tools. So we went out to Google and Facebook and Mashable and to um, you know, Hootsuite mm -hmm. and several others and created training programs um, so that it was a great way for these companies to be good corporate citizens in New York and to give back to their local government. And that's something that we're doing as we go to other cities now. We recently did that in Kansas City with Hootsuite mm -hmm. um, and another local company that basically came in and was training the social media managers and communications folks within the government. Yeah. And I'll just say that having the examples of New York, for example, uh, you know, in San Francisco and lots of, lots of folks uh, here in Washington, uh, having done this has been immensely helpful mm -hmm. you know, for, for all of us uh, because cities definitely learn from each other. Yes. So. Yeah. And it sounds like you have to be um, talent recruiters within the agency, which is probably mm -hmm. familiar to folks here when you have limited budget or zero budget. You have to be able to identify who within the agency has a passion or a talent. Uh, and really bring them over to your to your cause. Yeah. Uh, definitely, and I think that it, as we started, as word got out that we were embracing this and we created this agency, people came forward and they wanted to share their ideas. And yeah. you know, people want to share best practices, and that's why we created something called Engage, where we did these training sessions to make it very transparent so that the other agencies could see how they were using social media or um, engaging with their constituents. And now we're trying to take that you know, to different cities. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think Catherine's point is, is really exactly right. What we found is, is that there are good people doing stuff all over the city. And uh, to a certain degree, you simply have to find them and give them permission to do more, mm -hmm. if you will. And a little bit of a little bit of a you know a, how can I put it authority, and or um, you know support oftentimes coming from the outside in order to help them do their jobs. And I might add that I think yeah. the three yeah. things that we really cut during the recession were professional development, communications, and IT. Right. And I think it's really interesting when you think about how we can leverage. Uh, so much more when we have strong communications and we still we're constantly challenged with how do we reach all of our employees not all of our employees have email right. not all of our employees have access to the internet and so we have all these kind of a uh, very dynamic uh, workforce that we have challenges within and then if you think how that kind of extrapolates out to the broader community if we don't focus on these things as part of our priority which is why we developed a digital roadmap to really help us look across the organization and how we leverage those limited resources we do have to be more effective in that with the work that we do. And you know, you're seeing in different cities, you know, Mexico City and um, Rio, mm -hmm. are, are, you know, starting to have conversations. It's just amazing to see, you know, hackathons or different organizations that are coming together. And millennials are very interested in civic engagement, mm -hmm. and they really want to give back to their local government and find ways in which they can connect. And so, you know, these, these, there are pop-ups all over the mm -hmm. place in these cities where um, you've got entrepreneurs meeting government leaders um, and young people and academic institutions and really wanting to make a difference. And so it's really wonderful for somebody in government to have that outpouring of support yep. When you don't have the resources internally, yep. you know budgets are cut. You don't, you can't hire anyone. But to foster these community relationships is really heartwarming and, and a godsend in many senses. Yeah. I mean, I think um, you mentioned Kaufman Foundation out of Kansas City. You know, they do a program called Startup Weekends, um, which I think is sort of fabulous. And it's sort of a combination of a hackathon, you know, a mashup of a whole different group of people and so on. And we've been doing a lot of hosted events and working with a lot of organizations around the city to get folks to come in, not just into City Hall, although we did that too, uh, total fun, but in addition, getting folks all over the city to actually go and say, okay, how do we get together, have a little fun, create something, you know, and build a team out of nothing. And it's, a, it's kind of a great model 
that um, is less than just a few years old. And you so, had a, yeah. an amazing last summer, the Open right. Data Conference in LA, and that was a perfect example of that. Well, I, I sort of make a joke, you know, come into City Hall and have fun. Well, we actually had 2,500 people. Yeah. <laughs> 2,500 people. And we did a, a jobs fair, a tech show, you know, where we had everything, you know, out in front of City Hall and in City Hall. Uh, we had a conference. We had a meeting of Mayor Garcetti's initial meeting of uh, his technology and innovation uh, council. And then we also held two hackathons. One hackathon for the adults. Okay, cool, big. <laughs> Uh, but also a hackathon for the youth. Um, total fun, total fun. And by the way, they won. And the, what they were doing was is that they were using city data. Okay, maybe that's not so exciting, but they were using city data to explore their city and make a better city, mm -hmm. which actually was total fun. So. And I might, yeah. I think one of the things that we've seen is that there's often a challenge with, it's great, people want to get engaged and there's new ways and new channels, but the city doesn't, has, has learning, it's ad adapting its culture to figure out what to do with that input and with that engagement. So it's not only having a list of asks when a private partner wants to come up and, and, and do something for the city, so understanding what our needs are, but then also what do we do with that engagement? And I think that building that culture and for us, we've created the Innovation Partnership Program with the intent of right. creating a platform where once those great ideas come out of the hackathon, then you can partner with a city department to test that application that you've developed in, real, in a real environment to actually see how it works and kind of give you one more step in the proof of concept to potentially even building a business out of it. And how much of your role, I mean, the, our title is how can local government support the tech industry, right? So how much of the role is thinking about bringing in the tech industry, doubling down on the tech industry, uh, rise, raising it up w among other industries? Well, I think that, you know, looking back on the years when we were in New York and again now experiencing this on the road, I think that you have to understand first what is the mission? What are you trying to accomplish? Because there's so many different layers here. Right. And when you're thinking internally, how can, you know, your agency or several agencies within government survive um, and use these tools. It's um, training, mm -hmm. um, but it's just being very clear on the message. So you've got to identify what's the strategy, what's the goal, what are we trying to accomplish? And then you've got to take it to the other agencies and convince them that this is a good thing to do as well. So you've got to sell it internally. And then you've got to do the training, and then you've got to do the implementation. And you've got to be mindful of the maintenance of that and to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And I think that creating the public-private partnerships will ensure we've all experienced dramatic budget cuts, um, you know, and I think having the public-private partnerships ensure that there's you know, uh, continuity. Mm -hmm. And also after the administration ends, you know, and we experience this after three terms, you know, you've got to learn to let go and mm -hmm. you know that somebody new is going to come in and you hope that a lot of your programs will remain, um, but the public-private partnerships help ensure that there's continuity of those programs. So I think that that's the critical component. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, I, how many people um, have these? Anybody here? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you I know think more people have those phones and raise their hand. <laughs> I know, it's the afternoon, come on. I'd be willing to bet that there are more of these than there are actually people here. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't counter them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, you know, so it, it's sort of transformative because, um, I, I'll give an example. So a fire chief up in San Ramon uh, uh, witnessed somebody having a cardiac arrest and um, he realized that he knew CPR and he, and he had this idea, well, what if we actually were able to tell people uh, nearby to somebody who called 911 for, for a heart attack that, in fact, somebody was having a heart attack and somebody who knew CPR could actually come render assistance? And so he created a foundation called Pulse Point. Mm -hmm. And uh, we deployed it in Los Angeles pretty recently and it's tied into our fire 911. And so uh, you have the firefighters who are using the app, you know, because it tells them more about what's going on. But then in addition, when somebody calls 911, it actually crowdsources CPR and the defibrillators, if you will. And it's almost a perfect example of you know, the public-private partnerships that, that Catherine's talking about, you know, in a very, very real way, you know, literally uh, connecting up incredibly useful things straight to the smartphone in your pocket. 
So. And, you know, and then we were hit with Hurricane Sandy, right. and that really put us to the test. Mm -hmm. And it was because we had started to create those partnerships. Um, you know, and when Hurricane mm -hmm. Sandy hit New York, right. you know, the 311 call center went down, the city's website went down, and so it was Google and Facebook mm -hmm. that stepped up and really helped us, you know, with putting out maps, to, because the big question was, am I in an evacuation zone? Right. And we just couldn't push out that information fast enough. And so we had built, you know, and, and, and laid the framework for those kinds of relationships, but it's during a natural disaster at that level, or even during a snowstorm, or now you're dealing with the drought, yeah. you know, that these pushing out that information, city government just don't, doesn't have the capability to do that. Yeah. And I think there's also, technology has also changed the type of issues that government or city hall has to contend with. I think the sharing economy mm -hmm. has challenged mm -hmm. a lot of local governments to think differently about rules and regulations that are often built or an accumulation of bad experiences and that's why we have these ordinances on the books because something bad happened we reacted and council passed a rule to make sure it didn't happen again and that's our role as government is to provide for the general health and safety of our community and I think we have been really challenged by kind of the advent of new technologies to really think differently about you know what is the intended outcome of our policies how do we regulate things in a space that we don't it's not traditional it's not something that's brick and mortar that we really understand and I think Understanding that and partnering with our community to have navigate those issues has been really essential for us as an organization to evolve as quickly as the, our community has been. So you're being consulted by some of the policymakers on, Absolutely. on these issues. Yep. That's great. And talk about sharing. I mean, each city is clearly very different. Uh, you know, we're here in the Beltway, which is its own special place and has mm -hmm. become a very smart city and, as I was saying, a very cool city. Uh, but I think given how much we all have on our plates and, and again, limited resources, you've got to share what works. So are there templates that are existing? I know, Catherine, you're doing a lot of work on this. Well, we just, you know, we're thinking about it. And I think that w wherever we go, other cities want to know what's this other city mm -hmm. doing. And so everyone wants to know what's happening in LA, what's happening in Kansas City. And people want to share ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, when I was just in New York, it was agency to agency, mm -hmm. but now it's city to city. And we've been talking about different ways in which we can make those connections. You know, we get together periodically, but we probably should do more of that and, and maybe have a shared resource online so that chief digital officers and innovation officers in other cities can, you know, can share best practices or even share some of their challenges or even if they're lucky enough to have the budget to hire people, they want to hire the best and the brightest. Mm -hmm. And so that would be an opportunity to develop. And I know when I joined the city, I was one of about a dozen chief innovation officers across the country. And so it was a very small network that we convened very quickly to, to share. Because we, we have, although our cities are of a different scale, some of the problems are very similar. And so uh, it's, and it's a lot easier to make a case for bringing something new to a city when you can demonstrate the outcomes and the lessons learned somewhere else. So we benefit from each other. Um, I have a very good relationship with Dan Hoffman out of Montgomery County, and we're both working in the smart city space, and so we learn a lot from kind of how we've approached setting up the different relationships with, with uh, different companies and things like that. And I think that's really critical because it's, it's a, there's a lot of new things, and so working together has helped us be able to navigate those things. No, it, we're also in a period where, um, you know, we're, we're being affected by great technological change. Mm -hmm. I mean, just full stop. It's hitting every part of our lives. And since most of our lives in cities, you know, by definition, is hitting cities uh, big time. You know, whether it's new paradigms, ride sharing, you know, all this sort of stuff. But then in addition, uh, we can all see it coming with connected cars and eventually autonomous vehicles and all this sort of stuff. And we're, you know, body cams on police officers. Uh, technology is hitting everywhere, digital services. And so to a certain degree, um, cities, you know, are sort of facing this incredible wave of, of uh, disruption and change, to sort of use those terms which are overused. Um, and we're all learning from each other doing it. What's happening in New York is really quite influential, but also what's happening in Austin and Kansas City, Shanghai, you know, you name it. Uh, these cities have, you know, sort of the old joke about families, they're, you know, well, anyway, I won't, I won't repeat the joke, but <laughs> cities are to a certain degree the same way, which is that we all have similar problems, but they're all slightly different. Mm -hmm. And uh, learning from each other has been, you know, uh, is fundamental. And I think so. there's some basic questions that we're yeah. coming I mean, this is still relatively new to most yeah. city governments using a lot of this technology or using social media. Mm -hmm. So we're getting questions like, you know, 
many tweets a day should right. we be putting out? Or how many Instagram photos should our mayor be posting? You know, I mean, so it is a very, very basic approach. And then it goes to the other end of the spectrum, you know, where there's massive innovation and, you know, like, a partnership with Waze and what mm -hmm. you were talking about and how, you know, you're, you're pushing out information and creating these new alliances that we wouldn't have expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so today is actually National Bike Day, uh, if you all notice, which is a fitting day to have this panel. Um, and so closing question, what is another city doing that you hope you can accomplish uh, or something that you think should be inspiring to us all? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Well, I, I just came back from Rio, and Rio is, you know, getting ready for the Olympics, and, um, you know, they've got a tall order ahead of them. Um, but they have really been in the forefront of using technology, and they have such a sense of design. And so everything from their call center to their emergency management system, how they're working with companies like Waze, it's just very, very innovative. But they came up with such a clever idea. Um, they have a marketing company in Rio called Prole that does a lot of the branding for the city and does a lot of design. And so the mayor, Mayor Pias, is very dynamic, and um, they sold him on this concept of creating a a character, it's called the um, Explainer, <laughs> who is a stand-up comic in Rio, and he's the alter ego to the mayor. And so they produce these short videos that they stream <laughs> out. So when the mayor gets hit with these controversial questions, he lets the Explainer you know, do this whole skit. And it's gone viral, this whole campaign. And it's just a very clever way of using media, diffusing it with some comedy, mm -hmm. but also pushing it out on the city's platforms, but creating partnerships with mm -hmm. the local media that I think is quite clever. Yeah. Seems to have worked also at the White House Correspondents' Dinner for Absolutely. the President. Yeah, so I think... <laughs> Maybe he'll show up next year. Yeah, that's the new model. Yeah, we should get him up. Absolutely. How about you, Peter? You know, I think um, one, of the, one of the things that is emerging, which we're going to see is, so there's this whole concept of the Internet of Things and a lot of discussion around all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're watching you know, national debates about net neutrality and the open Internet, uh, municipal Wi-Fi, all those things. And there's a, um, a development that is coming in New York called Link NYC. It started with the Bloomberg administration. And, and de Blasio's administration is really doing a great job with this. And it, what it is is it's reimagining city pay phones. Uh, you remember those things that you all ignore? Um, and they're reimagining them as kiosks, as uh, free high-speed Wi-Fi. Uh, by the way, they're, they're, they're toll-free calls to anywhere in the country, uh, which is what you would expect. Uh, so it's really not a pay phone anymore. It's now uh, an information source. But oh, by the way, it's providing broadband connectivity to the Internet. Because I think we have a big challenge with digital divide full stop, mm -hmm. right? We have issues with equity and diversity and digital divide across technology. And so if New York is successful with their model of driving out the Link NYC stuff, I think that that will be dramatic for, frankly, cities everywhere. So, Ashley? And I think with the proliferation of technology, I think I look to cities like Chicago that have done really great work in the data analytics and understanding how they can best maximize all of this great information. Our citizens are providing us incredible amounts of information through our surveys and our 311 centers and things like that. How can we use the information that we already have within City Hall yep. to do our job better, to better align the resources to needs? And I think that's something that we're, uh, as we see the proliferation of more data, sets through smart city technology and other uh, channels, I think we start to uh, get a little overwhelmed. And so I think looking to cities that have done a really good job of, of bringing that capacity to analyze that data and understand how that translates into change is going to be really critical. The next. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that the key, when you're thinking about government and technology, I mean, the three key areas, it's infrastructure, you know, and looking at how can a city support the tech sector. Um, it's looking at education, and it's really creating that pipeline, job, you know, workforce training yeah. or higher education. You know, we, the Applied Sciences <laughs> Initiative in New York with Cornell Technion mm -hmm. prompted NYU to create CUSP mm -hmm. and Columbia to also exp extend its engineering programs, and Carnegie Mellon is now going to be moving to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And the other key piece is the marketing. And the marketing is so critical because you can have all of this innovation, and there's a lot in Kansas City and Los Angeles, but you've got to promote it, yep, yep. and you've got to put it out there. And we did that with the Made in New York initiative mm -hmm. in New York, first for the film and entertainment right. industry, and then applied it to the 
tech mm -hmm. sector, and it really helped create that sense of community. Mm -hmm. And it helped locally in New York stitching together the tech sector and the startup community because there was so much local pride. And it really was at a time when New York needed it. Yeah. Um, but now we see that propping up in other cities because other cities have that sense of local pride. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's touching on the maker movement, whatever it is, but I think that that's a really important yeah. component infrastructure, education, and the marketing. Yeah. All right, well thank you for all that you do for bringing local governments and the tech industry together and thank you for joining us today. And I encourage you to follow all the great work that they're doing and their organizations are doing online and we'll hope to see you back at Digital Beltway next time with more updates. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much.